Yo, what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD, pro physique athlete, back with another episode on Swole Radio. Today I'm joined again by the one and only Dr. Eric Helms, who is a celeb on this show, and he comes back today to help us talk about cardio. Thanks for joining us. Wow, I'm a celeb. I've been, uh, I've been, I've been, I'd, I'd consider it a downgrade rather than an upgrade. I'm, uh, <laughs> normally I'm a researcher or a coach, but now I, I am actually just uh, not even an influencer. I'm a celebrity. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, no, thanks celeb. for having me back on. Always appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you again, man. So today we're going to be talking all about cardio, which is somewhat of a con- controversial topic in bodybuilding. A lot of people have different views on it and we're going to bust a lot of myths today and provide some insights that are going to be really helpful for people. So I was thinking, you know, just to start off, Eric, maybe we could just talk about the definition of cardio. Absolutely. So the the typical definition of cardio, either cardiorespiratory or cardiovascular work, if you will, um, normally comes down to trying to get actual unsurprisingly, cardiorespiratory or cardiovascular adaptations. Um, so it's your typical quote-unquote endurance training or building a quote-unquote aerobic base. Um, and those definitions aren't really helpful for the bodybuilder in most contexts. Um, there is some data we might be able to get into or talk about how you know, not being in decent aerobic, aerobic uh, shape could actually get in the way of, of building muscle. But for the most part, Cardio for bodybuilders is just trying to increase the other side of the equation, which we typically focus on in prep, the energy expenditure rather than the energy intake, so that we can actually, uh, you know, facilitate that fat loss, get an appropriately sized deficit. And it could be a nice tool um, so that your energy intake doesn't have to get too low or especially in smaller competitors or very uh, spend thrift competitors, if you will, where they seem to get a fair amount of adaptation in their uh, other compartments of energy expenditure besides exercise activity, um, it's a good way to prevent like your actual diet from being too restrictive. Even if you're following a quote unquote flexible approach, if you're only eating 1500 calories, like how flexible can you be? So upping your output a little bit allows that diet to have a little more quality and still get you to the same deficit. So anyway, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then what are the different types of cardio that we should be thinking about? People always talk about hit versus lists or even mm. other subtypes like moderate intensity. Yeah, it's uh, it's very hit or miss. That's a terrible joke, but um, the yeah. So the oh general definitions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running out of here. De- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you'll you'll hear from a terminology perspective, people will throw around lists, which is low intensity, steady state, uh, or you'll you'll hear typically hit. You won't often hear hiss, like high intensity, steady state because it's very hard to maintain a steady state of a true high intensity. So, um, so yeah, hit, miss list that's moderate or low intensity, steady state, hit high intensity interval training. Um, and yeah, they, I'd, I'd say now in 2022, people are a little less into these camps that, that fight about that. And there's a little less of a obsession with hit, but man, there was a solid five, six, seven years where people really thought, you know, if I do, you know, lists or miss that can create some problems, but hit will avoid them. Um, and that all kind of, kind of comes down to the, the energetics and research on the interference effect. Um, but yeah, I think that is becoming more and more clear as we get data on those topics. But anyway, there's basically low, moderate and high intensity. Um, and it can be done as intervals or not. Um, but typically in bodybuilding circles, you'll run into those three acronyms, lists, miss and hit. Um, but there are certainly, um, a lot of different variations, even within those, well, at least in the high intensity department. Mm -hmm. And then does weight training count as cardio? Something I get asked a lot. Well, I think that all depends on, on what do you count it for? So if, if you're counting, uh, if if you're purely looking at as, as, okay, I'm doing this to burn energy, then yeah, you know, like, uh, your, your weight training does burn, burn calories. If you're purely looking at it from I'm trying to get uh, cardiorespiratory adaptations, it's all based on context, right? So if you are someone who's an endurance athlete and you stop doing, you know, all that endurance work and you switch to doing bodybuilding training, your VO2 max, which is one of the indices we have of, you know, cardiorespiratory fitness is going to go down. Um, However, if you take someone who is not exercising and they start doing resistance training, their VO2 max is going to go up, right? So there, there is... 
not these nice little neat energetic boxes that we can put work into like oh this is anaerobic this is aerobic this is you know only getting these adaptations only getting this all of our energy systems are working to some degree all at once um, of course there's exceptions to that but i think it's probably more helpful to think that there's a continuum or a spectrum and that the energy systems are overlapping and even when you are doing very high intensity work during the recovery periods you are using the aerobic energy systems you know like there's there's work there's research out there and this is a bit of a tangent but i think it just illustrates a good point where if you take someone through a high intensity quote unquote resistance training protocol so lifting reasonably heavy you'll find that they've actually depleted some of their intramuscular triglyceride stores um, mm -hmm. and that's not because they're burning it to fuel contraction but rather during those rest intervals as their heart rate is coming back down and they're getting you know like if you, if you think about it you know you do a set of five reps heavy on a squat your heart rate might be getting up to like 80 90 percent of the max you know so you are getting some of it, it is very similar energetically to some of the higher intensity forms of of hit uh depending on the rest to work uh, interval and ratio mm -hmm. yeah no it's just kind of something i was thinking about you know especially when when you talk about like medical recommendations you know as when for health when we say you know like 150 minutes a week kind of thing those kinds of recommendations where yeah it does i like your approach where you know you approach these modalities as more so of a continuum right like you could be going from you know even going shopping to some degree is a is a form of activity right and a lot of it depends on your conditioning level i think that's an important distinction as well is the more research we do on uh, activity, mortality, um, metabolic adaptations, and cardiorespiratory adaptations, um, and the relationship between fitness and health is that we see that there, there is a utility in d making a distinction between exercise activity, activity, and then time spent being sedentary. So in many ways, they do operate on a continuum. If you're thinking about just how much stress do they put on the heart so that it adapts, like being sedentary, it's no stress and it's actually potentially if you're already active um you know getting in worse shape and uh, then there's you know walking around like you said going grocery shopping which is activity and then there's actual exercise and the reason why we can to some degree think about them as separate things is there are relationships when we look at the population level between those independent factors to some degree um so there was a large-scale meta-analysis done not too long ago uh where they categorize people into how sedentary they were. I believe it was in tertiles, so, you know, high, medium, and low. Could be quartiles, I can't quite remember. But I think it was high, medium, and low. And then they uh, also looked at people with how much time did they spend doing, you know, high intensity to moderate intensity to low intensity activity, and they put those into, into tertiles as well. And there was actually a relationship that was independent of the two. So for example, uh, obviously, the, the, the most protective against all-cause mortality is to have the be in the lowest tertile of sedentariness, so you spend the least amount of time being sedentary, mm -hmm. and then having the most time spent in moderate to high-intensity vigorous activity. Um, however, the people who are in that highest tertile of uh, exercise were not fully protected if they were also more sedentary. They were certainly better off people who weren't exercising and were sedentary, but you could see to some degree they're separate signals. If you compared uh, two people who both met the guidelines for moderate to vigorous uh, intensity activity, a great example for our listener is if you talk to two different lifters, both, one, both who trained five days a week for an hour pretty hard, uh, and one of them had a very, very sedentary lifestyle and the other one did not, statistically, of, certainly not for the individual, but on average at the population level, those two kind of archetypes of people would potentially have different risks of mortality uh, and to a meaningful degree. And that's been kind of repeatedly shown. Even in, even in athletes, there's like associational data. Like if you pump into a, you know, a, a multiple linear regression, uh, sedentary time, screen time, training time, there'll be some independent effects there uh, to where if you take even full-time athletes who spend a whole lot of time, you know, on their phones and being sedentary, Sometimes you see different, um, you know, body fat percentages that's been shown and uh, slightly different levels of certain health markers and performance markers. So I think it's, I think it's something that we, we do need to be aware of uh, and start to look at them slightly differently. However, from an energetics and energy expenditure standpoint, they definitely can be looked at on a continuum. And certainly you do get, you know, 
adaptations from something that might traditionally be seen as anaerobic to you know some of the aerobic energy systems and vice versa mm -hmm. yeah no that's a great point actually like looking at your lifestyle as well and you know, thinking about the broader picture and not, it's not that we just walk into the gym and you know flick on a switch and this will make us this will solve all problems kind of thing but yeah zooming in on what everyone wants to know about the gains the big question of the day i guess eric is does cardio interfere with hypertrophy yeah so i think the answer there is that from a pure mechanistic standpoint yes it can but from a practical perspective it's actually harder than you might think to create a scenario where that occurs so you know if we go all the way back into the 80s and look at the original research done by hickson and then we kind of dichotomize that and we come all the way into like 2020 2021 and we look at the most recent largest scale meta-analysis looking at the interference effect we see two different findings you know a very clear experimental uh, demonstration of doing a whole lot of hard cardio interfering with resistance training adaptations and then we see this you know the most recent meta-analysis suggesting that there's no significant effect of doing cardio on hypertrophy might be a little something for power maybe something for maximal strength but for the most part the most as more and more and more data comes out it seems like the interference effect especially for hypertrophy and strength has been overblown um, mm -hmm. and this is not to say that the prior data was wrong but more so one of the things that is done whenever you're trying to demonstrate early on in a field of research an effect is you stack the deck very transparently and so everyone is aware you look at the methods it's saying exactly what they do but you might do something like give them a very hard cardio protocol and then on the same day immediately afterwards have them resistance train and you compare it to, to another group who just didn't do the car, hard cardio protocol and then you that's basically what Hickson did and you see oh wow you know strength hypertrophy power these adaptations depending on the study design in the 80s and 90s and 2000s pretty clear outcome and when you then take those studies and meta-analyze them. There was one done in, I think, 2011. There was a pretty clear effect, a negative effect, that was dose response with the amount of cardio you did, the number of minutes spent for hypertrophy power and strength is worse for power, uh, you know, middling for, for, for strength and not so bad, but still there for hypertrophy. However, now, after the kind of that early era of the first couple decades of research establishing this is a thing, now people have done research on, well, how do we mitigate it? And it's actually quite easy. Um, and you get to the point now where instead of thinking about the molecular interference, you know, where people start talking about like the effects of AMPK and, you know, you know, fiber type transitions and, you know, things that require you to, to have an understanding at the cellular level. Now they're talking more about the logistical side of it and practical quote unquote interference. Um, so if you were to basically in a hierarchy, you know, if you were to do your, your, your endurance training immediately before resistance training on the same mm -hmm. day, most obvious effects and depended upon how much work you did and how hard it was. If you were to swap the order and you resistance train first and did endurance training later, nullifies a lot of that negative effect, but not completely. Mm -hmm. If you do it afterwards, but four hours later, nullifies it even more. If you separate them on different days, nullifies it even more. So you can get to the point where the interference effect requires a lot of caveats. And it's not just, you know, if you did a, you know, from a periodization perspective, if we did a couple of mesocycles where you did both, you're screwed. But, oh, if we actually look at the microcycle and the day-to-day -day setup and how we structure and distribute your training stresses of different types, we can all but eliminate it for the majority of adaptations. Um, but I do think we now get to the logistical, you know, problem, which bodybuilders don't have to worry about of, okay, well, can I be a high-level triathlete and can I also be a high-level Olympic weightlifter? And the answer is probably no. And the closest mm -hmm. we see to that is CrossFit. And there are some really strong CrossFitters, but none of them keep, and some of them have crossed over to weightlifting and done really well and actually gone to the Olympics. We see that on the female U.S. team. Um, but what you don't see is someone who is still actively competing at CrossFit at the highest level and also actively competing in Olympic weightlifting at the highest level hmm. you know you get pretty damn good at both but it really just comes down to training hours how can you get the level of work at the intensity you need to do to reach elite levels in one sport or even very high levels and the other and you start to have to break those rules i talked about previously 
and you run into this kind of almost list recovery issue. It just, just comes down to how much throughput for stress is there in the system, and and you're just splitting your resources. It's it's no more complex than that. So for the average bodybuilder, um, you really have to do some silly things for this to become a problem, and um, some of those silly things were actively encouraged by our community. Like during during kind of the, the hit period, this was a very understandable reaction. Because like I said, 2011, we've got this clear meta-analysis, interference effect, this dose response. So people are starting to think, well, how do I work around this? And some of the high-intensity interval training research suggested, hey, this is actually more similar to resistance training than it is cardio. So, you know, therefore, similar bioenergetic bioenergetics, Eric speaks English, um, won't interfere, right? Um, but I mean, anytime you think about this, it's basically saying, okay, well, if HIT is the answer, then we should just be doing like more lifting. And that would be a, not a problem at all to do cardio if it's the same bioenergetics. So like, mm -hmm. like you start to see like, okay, so running sprints, um, or, or doing these like basically wind gates on a bike on a regular basis, that's not going to interfere with my, uh, my resistance training. And in fact, when we look at some of the not, not the most recent, but some of the, the recent meta-analyses, you actually do see small negative effects from HIT on performance. And it's not because of the quote-unquote interference effect, because of differential adaptations occurring at the, like the muscle fiber level, but it's just you're doing too much, you know? And that's something we're very aware of when we just think about it from, you know, doing too much volume or training too close to failure or trying to train in a state of a lack of recovery. This is something we, we very clearly understand. And I think it's important to have that big picture perspective. Um, so yeah, if, if you, you could probably do cardio every single day as a bodybuilder and not have the interference effect, if you chose your modality, right? So it wasn't something with a lot of impact. Uh, it wasn't something that you did before your training. Um, and you know, on the days you resistance trained, you kept the intensity easier and you thought about, you know, how you structured your training of both types. And you, you know, we're, we're happy to use low intensity modalities as well. You'd probably be totally fine, um, which is where we're at today, uh, where it's kind of a non-issue for the purposes bodybuilders need. To get in the kind of shape you need to be able to lift weights effectively and not have limitations because of your work capacity, low bar. Uh, and to get the kind of energy expenditure you need uh, for contest prep to be successful, low bar. And there is also problems with trying to really leverage far too much cardio as a means of energy expenditure now that we've become more aware of, you know, basically how total daily energy expenditure adapts, uh, the constrained energy model that, that has been getting a lot of press as of late, often a lot of slightly incorrect press. But basically the idea is that if you really mm -hmm. push up, up eat, you know, exercise activity thermogenesis, other compartments come down. So it's not quite as efficient a proposition as, as we would like it to be. And that some people seem to be uh, more adaptable than others, compensating for that cardio by reducing other, other components than others. But it's not to say that it's complete compensation. In most cases, it's almost in the vast majority of cases, it's not. It's just, you know, you burn 500 calories, it might for most be like 300, especially when you start to push the limits of doing a very high level of activity. So anyway, I know I went on a few tangents there, but um, basically what I'm getting at is in most cases, if you're doing things right, you're not going to have to worry about the interference effect. Uh, with some very simple modifications and just constraining the total amount of cardio that you want to do as one of the tools for for getting leaner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Opened up a lot of avenues that I wanted to cover. And yeah, I definitely want to get into kind of how to optimize your setup, especially say you're a bodybuilder who really wants the optimal kind of physique approach where you want to maintain as much muscle as possible or even continue to build muscle for some. In terms of choosing a modality, what should people think about? Yeah, I think the big one is you just want to make sure that it's not a modality that, well, there's two big ones, actually. One, you want to choose modes that you actually enjoy. I think that's important mm -hmm. uh, just so that you're in a good psychological space so that you can get it done efficiently. It doesn't add stress to your life. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. Listen to podcasts, listen to audiobooks, just reflect, you know, and be out in nature. There's, there's in the research, positive effects of taking a walk in the woods compared mm -hmm. to being on a track, believe it or not. So... Um, yeah, you want to think about your well-being because that affects everything. And then the second thing you want to think about is can I choose a modality which is less likely to have uh, any kind of recovery component? 
So one of the things that's popped up a few times in research is that, you know, cycling seems to be a little bit uh, better in terms of the quote unquote interference effect than, hmm. than running. When you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. It's concentric only for the most part. Um, you know, so it's not creating as much potential muscle damage, uh, and there's no impact, you know, like running, which is just a bunch of series of little tiny itty bitty single leg jumps, you know, when you think about it, mm -hmm. um, you know, you get your joints a little more beat up from that. So when you go into your training session, you know, you might be able, having to, to work around that a bit more if you're, if you're doing a fair amount of one or the other, that's not to say you should never run to be clear. Um, but I wouldn't use running as like your primary and only mode, unless you really loved it. You had great technique, prior coaching, and you just seemed to be pretty resilient to it. You had some of those structural adaptations since, you know, a prior era in your life. You'd be fine. Uh, but I can tell you as someone who ran the 400 meters in high school and then decided, oh, I want to do sprints, you know, when I did contest prep, you know, 10 years later, um, you know, in 2009 after, oh, not even 10. So in, in 2007 and 2009, I did my first preps, and those are the last time I did sprinting after you know graduating high school in 01 both times i strained my hamstring so yeah. or set myself up to, to at least i think set myself up to actually tear it in 09 during resistance training um so because the variable that changed was what and i started doing all this this hit and sprinting focus so anyway the uh the key points are basically choose a modality that will have the lowest recovery uh stressors on you and then also choose a modality you enjoy um and you're, you're probably going to be in a position where it's a non-issue, um, just limiting the dose, like I said before, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's funny that you bring that up. I didn't realize you ran the four. I was like a 400 Terrible. meter hurdler. It's the worst. Oh, yeah. it's even worse. 400 is yeah. the toughest. 400 is the toughest bend track, I think. It's that it is terrible. Burn. But yeah, I think that's even worse, actually. You know, if you if you have been trained to run fast, you are basically able to put much higher you know, force demands on your like tendons and connective tissues, especially like hamstring tears were the basic and basically the end of my track career. But it's the worst. Yeah, dude. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just to, to, to one more anecdote to, to, to support that recent, nah, like 2015 during my PhD studies. One of the things that happens in a lot of sports science research institutes is a lot of the postgraduate students end up participating in one another's research because it's hard to recruit. And you've got some, you know, physically active individuals uh -oh. who are, yeah. So I participated in a repeated sprint study. So I had to run like <laughs> uh, two different sessions of five 40 minute sprints. And on the second one, on the very last sprint, I had strained my hamstring. And the whole time, the, uh, the researcher was like, I'm impressed you're so fast. You don't sprint. And I was like, no, but I do lift weights. So I have the force production capabilities and my body remembers how to. However, this, like the speed of the cyclic hamstring contractions, I hadn't done that for since the last time I tore my hamstring, so <laughs> so yeah, I've had, I've had more hamstring strains than than I need to have had in my life post high school. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, and I like how you brought up the fact that we need to be thinking about recovery as one of the big players here. I think that you know people get have this conception about cardio that it's like this thing that it just zaps your gains as soon as you like pencil it into the schedule. But yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to more practical issues like the recovery demands and just your ability to recover, especially for say contest prep athletes where your recovery abilities really becomes a limiting factor in terms of, you know, actual hit style cardio, like high intensity, say there are people who like it. Do you see any advantages say for certain, uh, say certain populations like beginners or people who just might not be training with very high volumes in the gym? Yeah, the main advantages I see from HIT are people who are limited on time. That's probably yeah. the, the one at the very top. Because the a consistent finding in in HIT is that it is generally as effective, but in a shorter time window as mm -hmm. say modern intensity steady state. Um and it is harder. Um it does have a disproportionate because it has a disproportionate energy cost per unit of time, it means it has a disproportionate recovery per unit of time uh, yeah. demand on you. So yeah, it might only be 20 minutes of exercise like twice a week, but it's it's definitely going to be more like, you know, three or four steady state sessions, right? Um, so you kind of have to give it the respect it deserves where you place it, but it can be very useful if you've only got, um, if you have a very limited schedule and you can only get into dedicated cardio sessions of 20 minutes, um, 
it's not a bad idea. You just have to really think about how do you minimize the stress on other ways. Like I'm going to do it on a day off from training. Um, I'm going to do it on something that's low impact. Um, the next day probably shouldn't be a leg day. And, yep. um, you know, all those, all those key factors. So I think that, that, that is a key one. Um, cause you can certainly, for someone who doesn't do much volume of training and maybe doesn't have a very good aerobic base, you can achieve, you know, better aerobic fitness through, through other ways. Um, you, you could just do, you know, steady state cardio without issue. And I think it's very personality dependent, whether you find steady state or hit, if you match them for calories is more challenging. Um, but yeah, hit is, hit is pretty hard. One of the misconceptions in the um, kind of the bodybuilding community is that, and it's unsurprising because we have very extreme personalities, that it's not hit unless it's like an all-out sprint, which means that you're pretty much capped mm -hmm. at like what a 15-second work, you know, period. Um, but that's absolutely not true. Like if you look at the foundational research on what is considered hit, it's just over a certain threshold of, of you know, aerobic difficulty. Mm -hmm. And there are protocols that have two-minute periods or one-minute periods of exertion. And it is as high intensity as you can for that period. Um, and there are, again, it's, it's just basically intensity tra traded for, for time. The higher intensity it is, the less time you need to get the same aerobic adaptations, right? So um, it, it, you, you, you can scale the work to rest interval to your level of fitness and to the level of time you have. So that's the main utility of HIT. It doesn't seem to provide advantages over uh, steady state uh, in any way. You know, we used to talk about like mitochondrial biogenesis and, you know, no, no, not, not interference, but even potential transfer. And it might even help you get better gains. I don't think that really makes sense from a bioenergetic standpoint okay. for someone who's lifting, you know, four or five, six days a week. If you think about your typical bodybuilding rest to work interval, it matches some of the hit protocol. So, so the idea that you're getting some kind of novel, you know, stimulus from hit I, 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 I struggle to buy it. I mean, they're not the same. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to go that far, but I don't think you're going to be getting some kind of really new adaptation that is going to be very synergistic with what you're doing. Um, and I think if you were to really try to push that too hard, you just end up creating this huge recovery sink. Mm -hmm. And then out of curiosity, besides the recovery kind of issue, what are the mechanisms that people are proposing in terms of how it might affect hypertrophy? You know, this isn't specific to HIT, but there was a recent study where they basically did uh, aerobic precondition reconditioning mm -hmm. and then saw how it quote unquote potentiated hypertrophy. So one of the potential mechanisms by which hypertrophy slows down is when there is insufficient, you know, blood supply to you know, the muscle as it grows larger and larger, a simple mechanical issue mm. of nutrient delivery and metabolite clearing so that you can effectively grow. Um, you probably heard of myo my myonuclear domain theory. Basically, the idea is the initial hypertrophy, you're not actually adding uh, more nuclei to the muscle cell, it's just getting bigger. And then to make further gains, we actually start to see satellite cells get added, they become uh, nuclei, you know, muscle cells are multinucleated, and then each one of those nuclei governs a certain domain of muscle tissue. So that, you know, if we want to keep getting bigger and bigger, we need to have more nuclei. And that is more or less supported. It's more complicated than that. It comes into a lot of different domains of muscle physiology from, you know, hypertrophy to uh, muscle memory to the potential effects, long-term effects of anabolic steroids. And those do and don't you know, pan out the way we expected, uh, dependent upon the design, whether we're looking at animals, humans. So we're still uncovering a lot in that area, but I think we're, we're pretty confident in saying that at least elements of myonuclear domain theory are a thing, right? Um, and what goes along with that is as you get, you know, more hypertrophy, there becomes problems. It's harder for your body to deliver the nutrients and clear the metabolites uh, of, of what's going on in the muscle during contraction and during recovery. And that might be one of the bottlenecks to why we don't keep growing, right? So there's been some postulations how if we could improve blood flow in the muscle, improving capillary density, um, that could potentially help with extending hypertrophy beyond what it would typically be limited. So there was a recent study, and I don't have it in mm -hmm. front of me, so if, if I misquote anyone, because it's gotten a lot of attention recently, they did it within subject design, where uh, they trained both legs on the same resistance training protocol. 
uh, but one leg got a aerobic preconditioning period. So did like single leg cycling on one leg and not the mm. other. And in general, you saw that the leg that got that aerobic preconditioning grew more mm. uh, from the resistance training protocol. And it seemed to do with uh, the level of, you know, quote unquote, fitness, local muscular fitness uh, that was achieved prior to that, that, that protocol. So being in not great shape, potentially centrally, but also potentially from like a blood flow delivery standpoint in the individual muscles themselves um, could be a barrier. So there is something to be said for making sure that you're in sufficient shape generally. And the people, like the old school guys who were like, no, nah, man, I don't even take the stairs because I'm trying to avoid the interference effect could actually be doing more harm than good. And there are the odd quote unquote interference studies where occasionally the group doing cardio and training did outperform the uh, the other group. So hmm. that could just be sampling variance and, and error. Or it could be that looking at that specific population and the level of fitness they had before they had started doing both was actually complementary. So I think we need to not look at it in two black and white terms. Um, and I think people should strive to have a certain baseline level of fitness, baseline level of level of activity, and uh, especially people who have sedentary jobs in the off season, uh, kind of just kind of evaluate things and consider: Am I actually making this harder for myself because I'm? not as good at recovery and blood flow and my vo2 max is actually like in the the 20th percentile or something like that you know so um yeah i think that is a consideration probably probably more so as well for people in higher weight classes in strength sport where they're doing mm -hmm. even less high rep work um and you know they're they're really focusing on trying to gain weight so sometimes they're, they actually control their activity levels in other areas having talked to some you know big supers in powerlifting before yeah that's a cool point where there's this conception that people want to, you know, rest themselves so they're as, you know, fresh as possible for the stimulus or whatever, or, or seeing that, you know, when you bring in you know, cardio, like you can actually, it helps your work capacity and that can actually be, become a limiting factor perhaps if you're very, very deconditioned. Yeah, and this connects with some of the research we have on um, metabolic dysregulation and activity levels. So this is, you know, activity is, is a fundamental part of being an animal, which humans mm -hmm. are uh, going back a long time and in, in, in looking at what got us here. And our kind of quote unquote default factory setting, if you will, of what level of activity you would expect, uh, which seems to be associated with good functioning and homeostasis is typically higher than the average person has in an industrialized world in 2022. So, you know, like if, if you work from home, um, and you, geez, don't have, you know, an exercise, exercise as a part of your life, you probably got an average of two to 3000 steps per day at best, you know? Um, and unfortunately we have data on that level of, of a step count, uh, or time spent being sedentary and the effects on multiple different systems in the body. We have uh, data on hunger. We have data on the ability to handle a glucose and triglyceride challenge. So just how well are you able to dispose of nutrients and get them mm -hmm. to where they need to be without, you know, tr blood triglycerides and, and glucose getting to what would be considered pre-metabolic or even diabetic levels, you know. Um, we have data, associational data, of course, on uh, all-cause mortality stratified by different step counts. And we pretty consistently see in multiple different study designs, there's this convergence of data that suggests that if you are too sedentary, it can negatively affect your ability to partition nutrients. Uh, it can lead to earlier just death, just a higher likelihood, you know, odds ratios of all-cause all mortality. And it generally is associated with higher body weight um, and a higher energy intake that is above your, your baseline energy uh, level. So uh, just to cite a few key seminal pieces of research, there's mm -hmm. the Bengali Millworker study, which showed the J-shaped curve of um, activity, body weight, and uh, sedentariness. So they looked at different factory workers on the floor. All of them active by, by modern standards, but mm -hmm. anywhere from moderate to very high levels of activity. And the average body weight among these workers was all the same, and their energy intake just scaled with their, act, with, with their, with their job. So basically, higher energy expenditure, higher energy intake, maintenance of body weight. And then that J portion you know, on, on the left of this, this graph was the managers, the people who had a, had a desk job. So they were sedentary. And they were, I think, roughly 10 kilos heavier than all the factory workers and eating a similar amount, 
to the folks in the high activity category among the factory workers, showing that they had a dysregulated uh, energy balance. So their hunger was, was not as well regulated and they were consuming uh, the amount of calories on average as if they were twice as active as they were. So they were mm. sedentary individuals eating like they were highly active and therefore their body mass was higher, right? Um, and then when we look at more modern experimentally controlled studies, uh, there are multiple different designs where they either restrict someone's step count or stratify them by step count or just force them to be sedentary for a period of time. And then they bring them in and they do like an incremental treadmill uh, cardiovascular stress test after giving them a, a nutrient preload. So typically it's a bolus of fat or, or a bolus of carbohydrates or both. Well, typically it's a bolus of carbohydrate and or, or uh, sorry, and fat or just by itself. And they look at, you know, what do their blood levels get to? How quick do they clear it? And they compare it to a group that was not sedentary. And you repeatedly see in like this, I think I'm aware of like four or five studies uh, where if you have been sedentary or below a certain step count, which are two different ways of quantifying the same thing, you know, time spent sedentary or very low step count, you don't, you know, partition those nutrients as well. You're not able to quote unquote clear those nutrients and you see higher blood triglycerides for longer, higher blood glucose for longer. So it's dysregulating hunger. It's dysregulating our ability to handle uh, the nutrients that, that we give. And then we also see in associational data that right around that, like, say, 7,000 steps per day-ish is when you start to see um, the odds ratios of all-cause mortality get back to, like, normal. So that's generally my recommendations for people is, like, hey, hmm. if your average step count doesn't need to be every day, um, you probably want to get it above 5 or 6K, which is not hard. You know, if you go, if you're not super, super short and you go or, or super, super tall, like in, in most general ranges, um, if you were to go on a 20 minute walk, that's probably going to get you, you know, 1500 to 2000 steps. You do that twice in a day and you've already reached an amount that with your normal, you know, day, day to day, uh, expenditure, especially if you're lifting weights, cause those, those steps count all the, the time spent moving around loading plates. Um, you're probably going to get to that threshold. So couple of walks a day for the sedentary folks listening can, can do a lot uh, and it can prevent that not handling uh, nutrients very well. It can actually improve your hunger levels even though you're increasing your energy expenditure. It can more tightly regulate them uh, and it might even just be gen better for overall general health which is probably linked to those other things. So I think that's an important thing to state and that might be all it takes to kind of tick that box for the majority of bodybuilders. Yeah, no, good point. And that, that reminds me of a trigger i have which is you know when you see personal trainers in the gym with their athletes or their their clients and they're like loading the plates for them mm. <laughs> just like hmm, this is ironic hey maybe maybe the trainer's trying to get a step count up <laughs> <laughs> um when if someone wants to be really optimal and say they're like a contest prep athlete and they're trying to, you know, set up their cardio sessions throughout the week. Is there any optimal way of splitting it up in terms of, you know, the duration of the sessions? Yeah, I think some general things that you would want to do is you don't want to do your cardio before training. Um, and so there's kind of that, they're going back to that hierarchy I said. So yeah. essentially, you, you're going to be doing cardio um, and you're probably going to be getting in pretty good shape for, for, for most people doing contest prep. So, you know, some people get away with very, very little cardio. Um, those are typically people with the higher step count, you know, which I've noticed is, yeah, they're not doing a ton of eat, but their neat is very high. That's non-exercise activity thermogenesis and exercise activity thermogenesis. So for people who don't have a very high neat and they're doing a fair amount of cardio or just upping their step count, either one is fine in my opinion. I think you simply want to go through this hierarchy. All right. So on days I'm going to do cardio or get a ton of steps in, um, I probably want to do the majority of those steps or that cardio session after I've trained, ideally with some hours, you know, separated between them. Step count, that doesn't apply super well unless you're getting like a really long walk in in like an hour and a half, then that might as well be counted as a cardio session. But if you're just active mm. throughout the day, don't stress it too much. Um, you know, so that's, that's, that's ideal, separating it by days or at least doing it afterwards and uh, by, by multiple hours or, you know, if you can't immediately afterwards. So if you have a really, really packed schedule and you're like, look, I can get to the gym four days a week, that's where I'm going to get my cardio and my resistance training in, just do it afterwards. That's probably the best call that you could make. And then make sure that the cardio sessions themselves are uh, of, of a relatively low intensity and, and not super, super long. 
um, you know, but that's going to be very dictated based upon what you need to do to get in shape. If you can, you know, have all the time in the world and no time constraints, doing them on separate days from your training. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're forced to do them on the same day, doing it later in the day, uh, separated by at least four to six hours, but based upon most research. And that's how you can get the most, uh, you, the, the decreased likelihood of having any potential problem. Um, another thing I would say is you can overdo it, you know, mm -hmm. like if you're getting to the point where you are experiencing substantial compensation where the math doesn't work out for how much cardio you're doing and the rate you're losing and the amount you're eating, mm -hmm. you know, you're probably doing, doing so much that it's actually creating uh, some some reductions in energy expenditure from other components. So mm -hmm. you're basically experiencing symptoms of, of, of REDS, low grade. They're going to get worse as you get leaner. That's the fun of the sport. But that mm -hmm. means maybe you want to stop pulling that lever so much. So perhaps, like as an example, I wouldn't go over like 12 to 15K steps per day. Mm. Um, as an average, if you're, if you're really exceeding that, I would actually rather see someone bring it back down in that range and just eat less. Um, but you know, of course, like horses for courses, there's going to be some people who find that less sustainable, harder and get worse outcomes due to personal preferences or their environment or situation. But as a general average rule, I, I wouldn't want someone who's pushing 20 K steps per day so they could eat more. Like, I think that, that, that indicates there's other problems, right? Like their, their food is is structured or the choices are in such a way that it's not providing even to some adequate baseline satiety, or perhaps their relationship with food needs, needs work before they are really leveraging, uh, you know, I'm going to be a physique athlete and let's do contest prep type of deal. Mm -hmm. And then what are your thoughts on facet cardio? This is something that's always been a topic in bodybuilding. Yeah, people swear by it. Um, you often don't have really well controlled anecdotes there. People who swear by it, they weren't doing cardio, not fasted to the same number, the same amount for the same amount of dieting time on the same calories at some other time point. Um, so the, the, the arguments for fasted cardio are, are typically related to, you know, acute better uses of, you know, fat for fuel rather than, um, you know, other, 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 other energy substrates, which I don't think makes, you know, a ton of sense. When you think about it, it's how things generally op operate. You get some arguments that are theoretical around, you know, stubborn fat loss. But until we actually see some experimental data showing, you know, preferential regional fat loss or enhanced uh, tissue loss of adipose, you know, stores over time, um, I think we're probably just going to have to be a little more skeptical of that. The data we do have, which is very admittedly limited, is not, hasn't found any significant benefit of fasted cardio. But ultimately, you know, we store... We store a little bit of fat anytime we sit down for a meal, unless we're in a really large deficit and the meal is that small. Uh, and then we lose it when we are, uh, you know, not eating and we, we use fat for, for energy. And it is the net change, you know, in a surplus, if you had lunch at 12 and then you had dinner at six and you didn't have a meal between there, you're actually tapping into fat stores at some point, but you're in a net surplus gaining weight. Um, and likewise in the deficit, you can see the same thing, but kind of flipped, you know, you're storing a little bit of fat at those meals and you're losing fat between them and the amount of fat loss you have when you're asleep in between meals exceeds the amount you're gaining. So focusing mm -hmm. on the actual substrate utilization in, you know, a metabolically healthy individual, which most bodybuilders are probably isn't something that we need to worry about. And we probably can't, you know, pull that lever as effectively as some people, you know, might think, but I'm, I'm certainly open to being wrong about that if we get more data. But for now, I see fasted cardio as if it's low intensity, I wouldn't worry about it. Like no one worries about like fasted walking their dog or fasted going to the grocery store and then coming home and having breakfast. So I think on the flip side of it, people who are very, very anti-fasted cardio are probably being a little too aggressive. Like I, I'm not worried about someone taking a walk for 20 minutes when they haven't mm -hmm. had protein in the morning. I don't think that's going to amount to any kind of substantial muscle loss. We're okay. looking at a very slight shift in substrates and like grams of amino acids that might get used for energy you know <laughs> so um i don't even think in the long term that would add up to anything so if if it's just convenient for you to wake up not have to worry about making a meal go on a 20 minute walk come home and have breakfast do it i really don't think you're you're getting some kind of monumental muscle loss um but i also don't think you're getting any monumental benefit from fat loss either so mm -hmm. what i would not do is you know get up first thing in the morning and do like hit or a long you know, moderate steady state session, like go for an hour long run. But if you want to do 20, 30 minutes of lists, I, I don't think it matters in the slightest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point where 
people should think about what's most sustainable for them and where they enjoy it and what kind of helps them achieve the overall goal where for some people for example like cardio might help them with satiety where they you know it, it might allow them to de delay breakfast a little bit or maybe they you know they'd rather do it later in the day depending on what helps them kind of reach their overall uh, targets for calories well said i totally agree with that and then another question that people will bring up is how about targeted fat loss from cardio you know like say a cardio modality that targets your legs more targeting fat there yeah we, we actually reviewed i reviewed it in mass a uh like a kind of localized fat loss protocol that actually did seem to work but it was importantly the only one and still to my knowledge is the only protocol that showed that and the actual numbers and the amounts don't quite add up in it so the actual practical significance i really do question and in the vast majority of studies where they've tried to look at, um, you know, proximal fat loss to the muscle when it's being active, they haven't observed this to be a thing. So, yeah, like I, like I, I kind of alluded to it as I was talking about fasted cardio. One of the reasons people do fasted cardio um, is to try to reduce some of the barriers into tapping and specifically to usage of fat. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll see people like com combine it with, um, you know, yohimbine based upon its, its mechanisms, and even sometimes decide to do fasted high-intensity cardio combined with yohimbine, and it's all basically like stacking all the mechanistic chips in your favor of, uh, of fat mobilization, mm -hmm. utilization, and, uh, and, and burning. And I think that's all well and good, but we are operating in a complete vacuum of experimental data. Um, and these are certainly not things without potential side effects, given... The, uh, the real fun potential like outcomes from that have been observed in Yohimbian research, like enhancing anxiety, creating water retention, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if, you know, it, it, it is a stimulant, you know, so it's, uh, I think most of the time the juice is not worth the squeeze. Um, and we have literally one study that I'm aware of on Yohimbian as, as an effective fat loss agent. So we're, we're really going out on a limb and for solving a problem that in my mind, is a problem that I don't see very often to where, you know, someone gets really, really lean and they just have a little bit more to lose on their legs and you try to lose more and they just lose muscle, but not fat. Um, normally there are other things which can be fixed in that scenario, dieting for a longer time period, um, looking at the way the diet is set up, how much cardio they're doing, how effective is their resistance training. Um, I have never in the time I've spent coaching, um, I have, and, I, and, it would, and this is not to say I haven't tried it because I certainly was someone who mm. tried personally for three different seasons, stubborn fat loss protocols, and you know probably all the way up till 2013, 14, 15. I'd use them with some clients. I'd try them out. Anecdotally, I've never seen them be more successful than uh, not using them mm. for myself or others. Um, and yeah, like I said, so I don't have the anecdote to, to, to feel comfortable to go out on that limb. Um, and when I... When I try things, I really think about, just probably because of my scientific training, like, all right, when have I used in similar people or the same person if I have had the opportunity to do both? How did that go? What did we do? Let's look at that and try, let's try to have the best observational comparison we can rather than like, oh, how did I feel about that? You know, so it, mm -hmm. it is, it's not just like, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hunch. I'm not going to pretend like my anecdotes are superior to other people's anecdotes, but um, I didn't see anything that would indicate uh, it, it did anything magic. Um, based upon, you know, visual outcomes and scale weight changes, which is really all we got. But ultimately, that's what we care about when we get on stage. What do you look like, you know? Mm -hmm. So to be clear, when someone does have quote unquote stubborn fat, what I have found to be effective is they need time. And if you try to rush the process, they will lose muscle. <laughs> they, they will get mm -hmm. really, really flat and, and not really accelerate the, the pace of losses there. So I'm not saying that stubborn fat doesn't exist. I think it does. Um, but I'm suggesting that it's very challenging to overcome that in a way that doesn't create some of the same pressures. Like if you're, if you're dieting hard to try to lose stubborn fat and you lose some muscle, we think that doing fasted hit, you know, with, with a ton of stimulants, that's, that's not going to be a very catabolic experience. Like, I mean, come mm -hmm. on. so I think, um, I think, I think it's, it's, it's tough to make, to, to square that circle, uh, based upon my experiences and the lack of data. 
I'm not suggesting that I'm I'm right without this lack of data. You know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So it could be that if we were to do some studies on this, it would show there were some marginal benefits, and then we'd have to do more research to figure out, you know, what's the right protocol look like. But this is inherently a very individual problem. You know, someone has really really tough time getting their you know their their hips and and and, and glutes or their thighs to come in or their lower belly and uh you know they're trying this out so i'm not discouraging people from trying it but most of the time the most effective protocol is give yourself more time than you think you need to diet and don't try to diet too quickly and remember that it will eventually come off you know you don't find people who are malnourished or, or starving to death who have like oh but my saddlebacks you know <laughs> so yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's a great point where you have to think about kind of the global picture and especially in contest prep athletes where recovery is such a big issue and thinking like, yeah, should I really be doing, you know, fasted hit and stuff? And I know the way I see it is by the time you start getting, you know, reaching for these extreme protocols, maybe you should have I planned a bit more time ahead of time and, you know, allowed that uh, calorie deficit to work. 100%. In terms of just practical protocols for people, say someone's doing their first contest prep or something and they want to start implementing cardio, how would you usually prescribe it for an athlete? Say they have a kind of pretty ideal schedule and say training four or five times a week. First step is I would have them in the off season, say in the month preceding prep, just have them start tracking their step count so I know where their baseline levels are. Hmm. Um, and then... The reason why I like step counts is because it takes care of part of that whole constrained model of energy expenditure issue. Okay. If instead yeah. of pre prescribing time spent, like if I was just to say in a vacuum, I want you to add three hours of cardio. If you were already at a relatively high uh, energy expenditure from non-cardio, just you, you're pretty active, uh, and you also happen to be someone who is a pretty spendthrift metabolic phenotype, it's very possible that those three hours would re result in a reduction in your baseline step count, and we would see a very only very small bump in activity. However, if let's say I, I get you in the off season and I go, okay, you, you, you're doing 9,000 steps per day just as you're, you live, live in life, and that's with no actual quote-unquote cardio sessions. Let's clamp that. So what I want you to do is track, keep tracking your steps and maintain 9,000 steps. That curbs a lot of the behaviors of you know, basically getting more sedentary in response to a diet that we see in some people, not all. Um, and, you know, it becomes a little more of an active process. And you have to think about the psychological cost of paying attention to something you previously were not. Um, but I think in this case, many times it is worth it. Okay, I'm going to maintain 9,000 steps. Now this person who I said, hey, here, do three hours of cardio a week, they're not going to see at least a drop in step count. They're still going to see other adaptations that you can't prevent. You know, increases in metabolic efficient or sorry, muscular efficiency at low intensities, um, other, you know, compartments of energy expenditure going down. But we've we've prevented one of those large losses in energy expenditure from occurring by clamping step count. Um, so what you can do is then from there, you could prescribe, you know, cardio in, in sessions and hours. But what I like to do, uh, so long as they have a decent means of tracking it, is then to take them to a higher level of step count. And it really depends on where they're at at a baseline. Like I said, I won't take them above 12 to 15, okay, hmm. in general. I think that's a, a decent range. Um, and I also, and that is totally just kind of pulled out of my ass, by the way. I don't like, I don't have like, oh, and this data suggests when you do 18, it hurts you. No, I don't have that. I just find that most people, based upon what is feas feasible for life, amount of effort it takes, and how it impacts other, other things. So anyway, um, if let's say they're at 6K, I'm going to use that as a, as a, an opportunity to to have more bump ups in step counts rather than bump downs in calories mm -hmm. um, if someone's already at nine like i said i might start them off just clamping that and dropping calories and not not touching it at all mm -hmm. and then seeing how they're doing with the nutrition and their hunger and stuff like that and if you know i don't want to touch their nutrition but i do want to accelerate fat loss i might take them to 10k so something like a 10, 15, 20% at most increase in step count in any given time. And then giving them directions on, hey, you can do traditional cardio to get these steps. Or you can just do, be more active, take, yeah. take more steps, park at the back of the parking lot when you go grocery shopping or go to work. Uh, those things add up and you'd be surprised. Um, but if they start to do actual cardio sessions to get those steps, then I go through that checklist that I mentioned before, ideally on another day. If not, you know, same day, four hours later after you've trained, if not after you've trained. So that's kind of the hierarchy of three. 
uh, for how to you know mitigate any potential negative effect on, on resistance training. And then if you're going to do a dedicated cardio session, let's go low impact. Um, so those are kind of the guidance I give someone. Um, and then it's just very individual. I cap it around 12 to 15 K, uh, and except for extenuating individual circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those are some great recommendations. And I like how you give people the flexibility to choose whether they want to have a scheduled session versus just increasing their activity levels where I think, yeah, there's a lot of things that can be really healthy activities that isn't necessarily just on a treadmill. Like last week, I just really wanted to like go for a walk across the bridge. And I was just like, yeah, I'm going to schedule in my, this is my cardio and it's great in the sun. 100%. Man. So yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap it up here. I think people will gain a lot of value from this and hopefully clear some of the fog and make this a little less hit or miss. Hey. So where are you right now in your training, Eric? Yeah, so I am planning to start prepping next year in 2023 for the season. Yeah, man. Hey, nice. So uh, yeah, that will probably start the diet in March because so I would like to be able to make it all the way to the end of the year and, and do Worlds. Um, so obviously if I start my prep, like I did in 2019 and like mid December, that's a long time to diet. And based upon my prior experience, that's when the wheels start mm -hmm. would, would, would have been falling off for a month or two. <laughs> so if I start in March and then pick shows in the latter half of the year, probably nothing earlier than July or August to kick things off and then focusing more on like the October range, then, you know, hopefully qualify for worlds, which is not too challenging, you know, placing top five in a an amateur show and uh or hell if i get the, the the huge honor of getting my pro card i can compete as a pro there that would be fantastic um so right now i'm, I'm in, in the off season focusing on just trying to get more uh more yacked and specifically doing uh like a specialization program focusing on uh, my lats and my and my delts trying to get a little more upper body width so i have more of an x frame yeah that's exciting it's, it's, it's cool when you can, you know, I, I love this kind of planning phase when, you know, you're pretty far out and you can really like set the, set the stage up. So that's going to be really exciting. We'll definitely you know, have to document your journey on, on the show as well. That's the point. Oh, yeah, awesome. No, I'd love that. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cool. You know, having the platform as well, where you can really document this. So It'll yeah, be good. you'll be able to, to watch my cognitive decline in real time. <laughs> <laughs> everyone pay attention to whether you know the background is getting messier <laughs> mm -hmm. yep <laughs> oh man okay so yeah and for anyone who wants to learn more about just the fundamentals of muscle growth and fat loss check out eric's muscle and strength pyramids he is an excellent treatment of all this stuff and it would be a great base for you to get off the ground so thanks again for being on the show eric uh where can people find you True pleasure to be on. Thank you for that recommendation. And you can always find me and all of our stuff at 3dmusclejourney.com. That is the number three, the letter D, musclejourney.com. And from there, you can find links to those books. You can find links to monthly applications in strength sport if you really want to nerd out and see uh, the latest uh, takes on the research relevant to bodybuilding and powerlifting every month. Um, you can also find all of our podcast links for the 3DMJ podcast, our blog, and besides that, you can stay up with me more regularly at Helms 3DMJ and also check out Iron Culture Podcast where we talk about uh, the lifting community and culture and history and science more generally. What else is there to need? All right. Amen. So thanks again, Eric. Until next time. My pleasure, man. Thank you.